Well, if you have your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 1. We're in a summer series that is kind of really deep and profound. We're talking, given the chance for us to go uh, talk a personal journey story. Like, what a story. What a man. Scotty, what, that, that message on Scotty was a deep and strong word. Can I hear an amen? And Pastor Michael, Michael Grove and Rob last week, and then Cody's going to come and tell uh, how he grew up without his dad and me killing him. Uh, it's going to be a great summertime together, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. I'm going to give you one of my life verses, things that I live by every day, things that got me through all the journey, and we're going to uh, stay with it until I finish with that. But in case you just want two notes, if you would love to go to Israel, we have a few openings. It's in December. Uh, Pastor uh, Cody will be down front. He's going with me. Jason's going with me. And Alberto and Becky are going. It's going to be the best trip ever as we kind of go in that time of year. If you're interested, uh, you can just meet him right down here. Cody will be right here in the front. And you can uh, go along if you want to. And all these things taking place, uh, be involved, meet some friends, have a good time. We're going to talk about having a good time. Do you believe Christians should have a good time? And that's a good time for Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. For I know, Paul says, he's in prison, this will turn out for my deliverance. In other words, he knows he's coming through. Through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectations and hope that in nothing, say nothing, nothing I will be ashamed, but in all boldness has always, so now also in Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or death. Oh, that kind of brought it down. Here's the statement. For me to live is Christ, and to die simply is going to be better or gain. I want you to say it out loud with me, would you? For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. We're going to talk what that means in a balanced view. Let's pray. Father, in these moments, may you speak to us. You know the worry we carry, and sometimes the emptiness and discouragement. Lord, we confess that even as Christians, we get angry and we get frustrated because we don't understand exactly how to work this out. But by your Holy Spirit, may you breathe upon our minds. May we hear it. May it go to our hearts. And may the joy and the strength of Jesus uh, liberate us and give us a great positive future. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. before you turn to someone and say, you need to listen because you really have to have this sermon. You're not going to, you, you need this sermon. You just need this sermon. Yeah. You may be seated. If you're married, you can say to your husband, you really need this. Pay attention. Don't leave. Our text this morning is from Paul in the Philippians. We just read it. And I'm sure that many of you have heard the importance of making a life purpose statement. How many of you have, have know what I mean by a purpose statement? Let me see your hand. Some of you do. It's a business thing that's happened. As a, as a Christian and as a leader, we, we train uh, young pastors and their churches to get a purpose statement in their own life and to get a something in them that will kind of anchor them what this is all about. And Paul is actually giving his, and it has become one of my two life texts, and I want to show you why that is. You've heard about this purpose statement. A purpose statement isn't something light that you just throw together because someone says to do it. It's a summary of the true motives of your heart. It's down deep. Paul says, for me, he doesn't say for everybody else. He said, I've spent some time. I tell you my experience. He says, for me, for me, this is what's important. It's the bottom line of who you are and what life you are going to live. It's why you do what you do. It's why you get excited about some things and don't others. That's why you make choices. A genuine purpose statement is the overriding theme. Now stay with it. Already present. You don't have to make it up. It's down in your heart and it's your passion. It's the reason you do what you do. Life on purpose. I'm getting just a little feedback, Michael, if you don't mind, if you turn on a little bit. You don't just write a nice purpose statement. You go deep in your heart and you find it and say, okay, this is how I want to end. This is what my life is all about. Stephen Covey said, you begin with the end in mind, how you want to have this reputation, what you want to accomplish, and you, you work backwards. And to some degree, Paul is saying that same thing. He's talking conversion. He's talking now when he's going through the trial of prison. And then he's talking through heaven along the way. Through Paul, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, please go ahead and start. Through Paul, the Holy Spirit is saying, if you want to live a great and significant life, if you want to be victorious, 
If you want to make it through the trials, how many want to make it through the trials? How many are in a trial? Yeah, it's hard, right? If you want to get through, if you want to get not off track in the good times and not give up in the bad times, you got to have this thing in your life that holds you to be. It's your statement of your life. So what's going to be your end statement? I mean, you have one. You just maybe haven't written it down. You need to go home and think about it. Uh, a few end statements of others. These are epitaphs that I kind of found on a, in a book. Uh, Gray from 1880s in, Nas in uh, Nantucket, Massachusetts. Uh, under the sod, under the tree, lies the, bo the body of Jonathan Pease. He's not here. There's only the pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. I think he could have done a little bit better one than that. You'll like this one. Here lies my wife. Let her lie. Now she's at rest, and so am I. <laughs> Obviously, they didn't get this stuff from the Bible, right? So here's what's happening. The Philippians are uncertain in this letter. They're going through trials. They don't know what's going to happen to Paul. There's real stress. They're now being persecuted for their faith. Some are losing their jobs, and Gentiles and Jews are trying to get together, and Paul, their leader, is in prison. And they don't know what is going to come out again. So he writes to them from prison to encourage them. He said, hey, it's all going to turn out right. I am confident this is going to turn out perfectly right. And God is going to be glorified in every situation. And he says, the reason I could tell you that, I know what I'm living for and what's going to happen. He summarizes his whole life in one compound sentence. For me to live is Christ. Or if I could take it in the Greek and summarize it in six words, which is what they say you can really boil something down to, life is Christ. Let's say this. Say, say Christ is life and death is gain. We don't like the second end, but just stay with me until the end. We're going to go someone really, really good on it. He wants to say he understands how to live. Arthur Ernest Hemingway was famous for being able to make words powerful and keep them to a minimum. He was in Cuba and they asked him one time, one uh, reporter, hey, can you write a whole novel in six words? They thought it'd be impossible. He took a moment, he wrote down on a piece of paper, six words, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. It's a whole story. You can hear the drama, you can hear the expectations of a mother, you can hear that something tragic happened and yet She's moving and selling on. It'd be difficult to tell more heartbreaking, wrenching, succinctly story than that. Your story in six words. A literary magazine began to do this. He could actually get a copy. Uh, not quite what I was planning. And people began to put in their six words life. And some of it, of course, is not biblical. We're going to get to that. But listen to a couple of them. Revenge is living well without you. That's a divorced person. Really. Singer Amy Main couldn't cope, so I wrote songs. I like this one. 70 years, few tears, hairy ears. <laughs> Only if you've been married more than 30 years, ladies, are you laughing at that one. Six-word story in my life, not mine. Here's one. Cursed with cancer, blessed with friends. So Paul writes from an unjust sentence in prison, God is working there even when he's there. People are getting saved. Uh, the household of Caesar is going. He says, now listen, church, do not be discouraged because I am on solid ground. And I'm saying, he's saying, I want to tell you why I'm on solid ground. I know there's a realistic possibility of this not turning out the way you want it. I know there's an end to this. But he says, I'm in a win-win situation. So he says again, I want you to know the source of joy and strength and victory. Are you still there? Say Amen. Christ is life. To die is gain. Let me break that in two quick parts before we celebrate communion and understand it. Stay with me. To live as Christ. This statement is at the very heart. If I had to summarize Christianity, what is wrong with it and what is right with it and how confusing all this ministry and church stuff and fighting and calling people's name and blaming each, all the stuff that you and I as believers work through, it gets down to this simple truth. Listen to it. Jesus Christ is life more abundantly. Say a good amen. amen. That's it. He is life. You live in him. 
He tells his story in Acts. He says, you know, he was a church hater. He, he was a part of a very famous family, highly educated, religiously conservative, the Pharisees. He actually said one time, concerning the law, I was found blameless. I did everything right. Now stay with it. But how many know you can live hard for God and be miserable? Yeah, they're called first service. <laughs> don't, don't worry, I say the same thing about you, so don't go calling them up. Yeah. It's true, look around us. Look what the world says about church and Christians. Because we get it sometimes wrong. He's not saying, I first live for Jesus. He says, I have learned to live in Jesus. He's full of hate. He's trying to kill the Christians. He's on a horse or a donkey and he's going to a city. I'm sorry, give me a little more now. I'm, I'm going to have to yell and they don't look like they want to be yelled at today. And he meets Jesus Christ. How many of you met Jesus Christ? Really, let me see your hands. I met Jesus Christ. He met Jesus Christ. He's knocked off the horse. The light is shining. He hears the word of God. And, he, and Jesus, the Savior, comes alive to him and says, Paul, I'm the one you've been looking for. Doesn't it hurt to kick against me? Fight me. And he says, oh, man, you're the real thing. You're what I've been looking for. I was hoping there was something more than all the rules I had. What must I do, Lord? And meeting Jesus and giving his life to Jesus, more importantly, letting Jesus live in him, he changed the world. Nobody believed in him. Nobody trusted him. He was a hater who now became a lover. But by the time he was done, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He stood for salvation by grace through faith. He was able to bring Jews and Gentiles, the two most separated groups, together through Jesus Christ. He did all this simply done, and he says, you know how we did it? I'm going to tell you how I did it. I live for Jesus every day. When I simply got that in my heart, when I simply figured that what is happening in my life, that I was raised in church, and I, I tried so hard to be right and good. My parents, my grandparents were so good to me, but it never seemed to work until one day I met Jesus Christ. You know some of my stories, atheist and hateful and burning things, and I never told my family, I, I think for 15 years, I never told a human being I love them, not a person for 15 years. One night, tired of religion, tired of atheism and Buddhism and anger and all the anger in my life. I knelt down. I said, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, come into my life. Live in me. Are you listening? Because if not, there's nothing worth living for. And you know my story. If some of you, Jesus came in. And I'm like, wow. woohoo! This is what I've been missing. And I came alive in Jesus Christ. All those years I was trying to give my life to him, and that was important. I just needed to let him give his life in me. I came down, I tell you, my, my family thought I was crazy. Do you understand, folks, J Jesus doesn't make people crazy? I can't see you, but you're not saying anything. Oh, there you are. No, you bring crazy to Jesus. Some of you are just plain crazy, and Jesus loves you, and he's trying to get you out of crazy. He is. Jesus doesn't make people weird. No, no, he doesn't make people weird. Facebook makes people weird. Twitter, dear Jesus. No, really. Jesus is the most balanced, healthy thing. You look at Jesus, when you talk to people, when I learn to talk to Jesus, you know what I find out? They don't mind Jesus. They don't know what to do with Christians because we don't always get it. We're not perfect, amen? Christians aren't perfect. They live in Jesus. That's what Paul says. In him, we move, we live, we have our being. I'm grafted into him. It's not me trying for Jesus. Every day of my life, I get up. True statement. I get up and know if Jesus doesn't live in me, I'm going to be in big trouble. I'm going to kill someone who runs the red light for sure. That's why I don't own a gun. I don't own a gun. I'm honest about it. So I say, Jesus, you've got to live in me. This old sinner, I tried by myself. 
live in me today, Jesus. And the most amazing things happen. Everywhere I go, somebody wants to talk. Look at my face. You don't want to talk to this face, but people do. They, they're like, can I talk to you a moment? I said, no. <laughs> I'm at Panera this morning getting oatmeal. Choir members getting bagels. I need to study. Took her 20 minutes in front of me to get the bagels. Was I upset? No. Well, yeah, I was living in Jesus, so I didn't say anything. Oh, I blessed her. A couple behind me walked in, 7 o'clock in the morning. Pastor Ross, we used to go to your church, but we left your church. I'm not him. He looks like me, but he's somewhere else. I don't want to talk about you leaving the church. Oh, we got to tell you what's going on in our life. Do I look like I want to hear what's going on in your life? I didn't say it, but I just made the mistake of saying, Jesus, live in me. That's all I made the mistake of doing. He said, oh, we were always wanting ministry and position. And we just learned after our fourth church that it's not ministry we need. It's just grace to live daily where God has placed us and glow for Jesus Christ. Can I hear a good amen? Now listen to me. The mistake of it is you begin to believe. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand for that one. This side too. The mistake is we believe when you're hearing preaching, if you're not a believer, you're thinking what he's saying is you only love Jesus. No, when you love Jesus, you do everything better. Really. I'm a better husband because of Jesus Christ. She's up there. She was soaked. She didn't want to come down. No, really. I was, I was not a good husband. I mean, I was a Christian minister, but I had never told anybody I loved them. We're getting married. A week before we're married, I had never told my wife I loved her. You know how I proposed? I said, you want this ring? <laughs> if you think I'm making it up, folks, I'm changed. Jesus has forgiven me. Please, this is not the one. I wrote, I love you on a piece of paper. She's crying. I said, that's why I don't tell you, because if you're going to cry every time I do this, I'm a minister. I'm a minister of the gospel in North Carolina. And our marriage is not right because I'm ministry. For me to live is ministry. And my secretary, God bless her heart, Rufine Bean. She says, uh, Pastor, get out of here. You're not allowed to sit here. Why not? You need to go up. I'm, God's told me every day you need to go up twice a day and put your arm around your wife and tell her you love her and sit there with your arm around her for 15 minutes. And I said, I don't think that's going to work the way you think it's going to work. It's going to scare you to death. We're going to have a heart attack. I did it. I walked up. True story. Ask her when, when you see her. When she's, just, she's the one all wet up there somewhere. And I went up there to the, to the parsonage, put my arm around her. I'm sweating. She looks at me and says, what do you want? This is the adult sanctuary. It's not dark yet, you know? No, I just want to say I love you. I'm on my arm around you for a few minutes to say I love you. <laughs> Jesus makes you better. I got better at it. When we had Matthew, my dad, so worried. My dad was working for him. My dad was so worried. And Matthew was wrestling on the floor and he's crying. I said, Dad, what's wrong? You're German. You never cry. He said, Son, I asked God not to give you any kids. I said, He's going to be the worst father God in the world. And here you are loving. It's not who you are, Randall. It's just amazing. What happened? Jesus happened. Not just salvation. Every day. Make me better. See, Jesus doesn't ruin you. When my grandfather finally got saved, this alcoholic, mean, old, nasty guy from, from Peoria, he's in the hospital dying of bone cancer, and he, a, a, a candy stripe, remember them, walks in. He looks at her and looks at her, and he says, man, look how gorgeous she is. I said, Grandpa, you're saved now. You can't go talking about a girl's legs and cancer. He said, Randall, Jesus saved me. He didn't ruin me. She's pretty. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not touching anything. I just was noticing. I said, oh, well, Grandpa, you got a point. But Paul says to live as Christ, he's saying live every day. It's a gift. How many know life's a gift? Say amen. 
So he says, yeah, love Jesus, but you can love your wife, your kids, your family, be better at it. Go yurting, go upside down, go bowling together, laugh a little bit, sing go, cubby go, have dinner and a picnic, live life every day. Say a good amen, but live it in Jesus and it gets better. To live is Christ. Made me a better brother. I was, we were young and my dad wasn't giving us our allowance. My mom had just gotten a front load dryer. Do you ladies still have front load dryers? It was like this. So I said, hey, my brother Rick, he's two and a half years younger. He's now superintendent of Carolina. I said, Rick, we can make some money. We're going to charge a nickel for rides in the dryer. <laughs> so I, it's a true story. I, he said, well, who, how are we going to do it? I said, we got to try it out first. <laughs> I said, get in. He says, what happens? I don't know. We're going to put you in. I put him in. Put that lock. You know how they used to have those things that you just kind of put a lock over the front of it? Push the start button. And I'm just sitting there thinking, I wonder how much we can charge for this. My mother came down and nearly killed me. I wasn't a good brother, but we're best friends now. Jesus makes it better. Can I hear a good amen? That's what Christianity is, folks. And Paul says something else. Jesus is life, and death is a door to better. All of Christianity, if we're one thing we're missing in this generation, are you listening? This is important. Say amen. Just for seven minutes, listen carefully. If I think one thing we miss at some time, we are so desperate to be practical for you. How to have a better marriage, God knows we need that. How to be better parents, God knows we need that. Can I hear a good amen? How to do things better, how to live better, do our finances God's way. We need all those things. We need practical help. But the Bible says these words, if in this world or life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. What do we miss? We squeeze all of Christianity into what we're going through right now and we forget that Jesus says this is only part of the story. There's going to come a day when you breathe your last and life leaves you, the breath. And in that moment, the best part of your future comes to you. That's what heaven is. See, I know, I know heaven, like, you think it's unpractical. What I need now is a raise and money. We need real things. Say a good amen. But folks, if all this, if we evaluate success and God and happiness with what our trials are right now, you're going to get a broken heart and discouraged and depressed. Even loving Jesus. And Paul says, I got this down. I'm between two points. This life is good, but I will someday stand whole in the presence of Jesus Christ. And since I have both, I cannot lose no matter what I'm going through in this moment. Dale Moody was in Lake Erie, and the storm was bad, and he was going to a meeting, and just thought the ship was going down. By the way, in those days, ships went down in the Great Lakes. And they said, Dale Moody, aren't you afraid? And D.L. Moody says, no, I've got two sisters, one in Cleveland, one in heaven, and I don't care which one I see today. Now, folks, I want you to hear this. Are you listening? Can I hear a good amen? God doesn't say hurry up and die. He's not telling you that you make a choice between heaven and a good life now. That's not true. I don't know what all heaven's going to be. He does. I, I, was, I remember those days like, oh, if you're happy and you're not miserable, then you're not going to have a good heaven. Well, that doesn't sound like Jesus at all. Does that sound like Jesus? Not when I was 12 years old. Jesus was having, he was doing things, raising things, feeding people, riding on donkeys, having a good time. He just said, there's more to it than this. So when you have this word, for me to live is, what are you going to put in there instead of Jesus? You're going to make a decision. You have it in your heart. For me to live is money. Trust me, that's not going to work out. Because money can't give you everything you need. Money is not wrong. 
Come on, folks. Money's not wrong. If you're guilty with it, give it to me. I'll take care of it for you. I'll take you off the guilt. If you're guilty about it, let me help you off. It's not for me to live as ministry. No, ministry isn't it. It's Jesus. For me to live is my family. Really? I sat at a wedding the other day. And, the, you know, these two young couples, stupid. You know how stupid they are when they're doing vows? Totally stupid. He says to her, you are the reason I live. You are the only thing that matters. I live only for you. I'm going to say, don't do it. <laughs> don't say that. Because she's going to have kids. And you're going to get bald and have a belly and be proud of it. And then you're going to have a grandkid called Melody. And now you're down 15th or 25th on the list of importance. Doesn't mean you don't love my family. I love my family. I love my little baby grandbaby. Man, we were out together and we're having a blast. I'm raising her like a healthy person. We're eating mac and cheese, seeing Toy Story 4. We're playing with the dolls. And then when she gets a little bit out of it, I said, you want to talk to Jesus? Yes, Jesus, Jesus. Yeah, that's right, baby. Don't, don't forget Jesus. What are you going to do when your kids tell you they hate you? For me to live is my kids' love. Hey, send them off to college. Move away so they can't find your address. <laughs> no, I'm making that up. But folks, they all come back. Life is, relationship is good. Say a good amen. But if it's only the world's view of happiness, if Christ, Christ makes you better, and then one day, one day, something is greater. Don't hurry up and die. Death is, by the way, folks, I'm almost done. Death is not your friend. Are you listening to me? Jesus says the last enemy of the believer is death. And one day he will defeat death and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more tears. Yes, sometimes death is a relief because there's something better. Amen? Amen. Amen. But don't ever call it the friend. You have to walk through it. But it's not what you, it's not today. How many would like to have at least one more day? Eight of you. In Bible school, in Bible school, we were always talking about second coming. You know what we say, Lord? Can you wait until July 18th? You know why? Because July 14th was our wedding. You're not catching any of this adult humor. One day... It comes. And what God says is, everything I told you in this life depends on you believing that I've prepared a place for you. And eyes have not seen, nor ears have not heard. No one can imagine how good it's going to be when we go face to face. And I, I miss, amen, I... I think sometimes, folks, we degenerate heaven because it sounds like a harp and a crown and going to church for eternity. I, I get it. That's not what I hope heaven is. I really got you on that. I don't know what it's going to be, but I got an idea, and the Bible says, Randall, your ideas of Pertillo's forever isn't even close to what's going to come. You believe heaven is riding on the pirates of the Caribbean over and over again, but are you not even close to imagining what I have for you? I know the plans I have. I know the place. I told this before, and guys, you can get ready if you want to prepare for communion. My dad, my hero, he passed, and I'll be preaching at council next couple weeks based on this sermon. And my dad was one of my best friends. My mom had died of Alzheimer's. You know this. I'm, you guys heard this. My dad passed. Uh, I couldn't make it home in time. I was out of the country. Uh, he had called me and says, Randall, can you make it? I said, man, I'm coming, dad. I'm coming. Uh, he passed before that. So I have to do the funerals. I'm the oldest child. I have to do the funerals. I'm now the 
the oldest guy in the family. And I got to be frank, folks, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't mad at God. I knew, I knew Dad was in heaven. I just, for one time, I've done so many funerals. I just wanted a moment to grieve, to sit in the pew, you know, to kind of like, Dad, I miss you. I'm so sorry. So our family was having this moment. My dad had always sponsored in the Indian Reservation, Oklahoma, Miles Moore, if you've ever, you ever been around missionary-wise, Miles Moore, when I was raised this high, he would come to the church, and, and dad had gone you know, into retirement on a bare minimum, and he always sent his money there to the Indians and uh, reservation. So we're, my, daughter, my sister and I are kind of grieving. And folks, I believe in heaven. Are you with me? Can I hear an amen? I just was one of those days where, okay, Lord, uh, I need you. And so my sister Beck calls this lady, her prayer partner, and they're praying. And the lady who is a spiritual, insightful person says, Becky, that's my sister's name. I, I just had a vision of your dad dancing inside the gates of heaven with American Indians. Now, we had never told what my dad did every week, with every month with his social security check. Never told that a significant portion went to this little reservation in Oklahoma, American Indians. And he, she said, you know what, Becky? I've never seen people so happy. There's like this joyful thing and they're doing this really cool Indian dance and your dad, my dad's German. I, he never danced, he never, he's German. <laughs> and he was, and all I thought was, Lord, I get it. Thank you. One day when you come back or when we meet you, we're going to understand how good it was to serve you every day in this life and be with you forever. Can I hear an amen? You know, we used to sing the songs, what a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. I would like to encourage you. Try this thing out. Get yourself a life purpose. Get a Jesus purpose in your life. Not this religious, Americanized, Facebook-friendly Jesus. Get yourself where you say, Lord, I'm with you all the way, in and out. I'm going to lean on you every day of my life. And keep your eyes once in a while on what God has for you because I don't know what it's going to be. You know what, folks? Are you listening? Can I hear an amen? I just, like last night at 2 in the morning, I'm praying for you. And I'm thinking, wouldn't it be good if all of us get to share heaven together and Jesus comes back and here we are, the thousands together, and we're partying and we're laughing and we're celebrating and we're patting each other on the back and all of all the troublemakers here have to serve us Portellos. <sighs> just kidding. Just what a day. Just what a better way to start communion. What a better way to regather ourselves to what Jesus says really matters. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and the ushers are going to hand out uh, after I pray if they haven't already and just hold on to it. We as a staff will lead you. And let me pray with you first. Father, I ask you right now, you know the burdens the sheep carry. There's so many things in life that weigh on us. It's normal. You understand that. And at a time we get discouraged, at a time we get harsh, at a time the hate of the world seeps in. But Lord, right now, we just let you wash us afresh. And may, as we celebrate your holy covenant, renew our strength in you here, that you are life. You have forgiven us, and Lord, your promise is true. One day we will celebrate this together. In Jesus' name. Pass out the elements, if you would. Let's sing Amazing Grace, shall we? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me now once was lost 
But now I'm found Was blind But now I see Twas grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieve How precious dear that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone which is the unleavened bread, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And think, wow, Lord, you loved us enough to be one of us to take care of this. If sermons were going to change the world, we would have had it a long time ago, but it takes people living in something and giving their life to something that's Christ. I'm going to ask if you would stand with me, please, so we can prepare to receive. If you don't receive, please don't feel any condemnation. Everybody's at a place... But if you're a believer, work through that to receive so that you can say, Lord, by grace, I'm going to live in you and I'm going to be with you forever. Pastor Rob, if you would pray. Father, we do come to you in the name of Jesus. We celebrate this moment together, eternity past to eternity future. We are here together as a body celebrating the shed blood, the sacrifice, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the coming again of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to take this offering of community with you and bless it. Increase our faith. Yes. Increase our love to you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive the body of the Lord. Paul says, again, I received the Lord, which also I delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. In the same manner also, <laughs> which one you do, doing, man? Go back in the same manner also. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. What's it end with? Till he comes. Not if he comes, but when he comes, it'll all come to pass. Hold the cup in your hand, Pastor Christian, if you would, please. God, we do thank you that you so loved us that you sent your only begotten son. And Jesus, we thank you that you went to the cross and you paid the ultimate price. You paid for our sin. And because of that, we have life in you and with you. 
And we thank you for that, God. In your name, amen. Let's receive the cup of the Lord. We're going to pray, and afterwards, there'll be people here to pray with you. If you have never understood what Christianity is, how you exchange your life, you give him your life, he gives you his. We'll be glad to pray with you, help you take that step along the journey. If you're going through a time when you need just encouragement before you go, we'll be here to pray with you and, and encourage you in, in the Lord. But I think we should pray for God to help each one of us shine for Jesus. How many know we can all do better? All we've got to do is humble ourselves. Lord, come on, shine, live in me. Let's pray that. Let's offer ourselves to him, shall we? Lord, with hands raised, we say, you are life. Live in us. We are grafted to you. Let us lean on you and trust you. You will never leave us nor forsake us. You are with us all the way. What you've begun, you're going to complete to the day of Jesus Christ. So let your Holy Spirit fill us afresh. Let the love and the power and the grace and the truth of God shine in us and through us. So this week, our conversation will be centered for your glory. And Lord, let us always look to the future. One day, it will be worth it all. I bless your people. May you provide and shine. May you bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Go with God's grace. You are dismissed.